Behind the laughter and joy of Disneyland, the happiest place on earth, lies a dark and haunting secret that few have dared to explore. Unimaginable accidents, bewildering coincidences, and unexplained mysteries, there have been incidents that reveal a terrifying reality and turn dreams into nightmares for some unsuspecting visitors. Here are 13 of the most terrifying freak accidents that have scarred the face of this beloved park. But be warned, the happiest place on earth hides secrets that are anything but. For over six decades, Disneyland has stood as a symbol of magic and joy, with its sparkling facade luring millions into its gates. Beginning as a mere 160-acre orange grove, Walt Disney transformed this land into an enchanted kingdom that has seen more visitors than any other theme park worldwide. Disneyland opened its doors on July 17, 1955, introducing 18 original rides and attractions to an eager public. Within just a year, 5 million people had explored its wonders. As of 2019, a staggering 700 million people have visited the park. But behind the smiles, the iconic characters, and the joyful parades, Disneyland also had its share of shadows. Though often referred to as the happiest place on earth, Disney parks, including Disneyland California, are not immune to the realities of life. Despite the strict safety measures and family-friendly environment, accidents happened. From terrifying ride malfunctions to heartbreaking accidental drownings, these parks have seen 91 fatalities from 88 separate incidents. Disneyland California, unique in being the only park designed and built under Walt Disney's direct supervision, sees approximately 18 million visitors per year. Tragically, as of August 2023, 27 people have lost their lives at Disneyland Resorts in California. This unsettling history serves as a sobering contrast to the fairy tale image that Disneyland so expertly projects. A place of dreams for many, yet a place of nightmares for a few. While most visitors enjoy a magical experience, some have faced unthinkable tragedies, such as the harrowing ordeal endured by Jose Martinez, a quadriplegic man who found himself trapped on It's a Small World ride. For Martinez, the ride wasn't just a minor inconvenience, it was a terrifying and life-threatening experience. In 2009, Martinez and his wife decided to enjoy the renowned attraction, but as the ride proceeded, things went awry. The ride broke down, and as other patrons were evacuated, Martinez found himself unable to move, the music blaring, and the urgency of the situation escalating with each passing minute. As his blood pressure rose and a life-threatening nervous system response, dysreflexia began to take hold. Martinez feared the worst. Trapped for 40 long minutes, he felt extreme emotional distress, humiliation, and discrimination as he remained confined, unable to escape his colorful prison. Martinez's nightmare led to a lawsuit that ended in a modest financial victory of $8,000. The judge ruled against an injunction on Disney's policies, but did determine that Disney had a duty to warn guests with disabilities of potential breakdowns. Although the ruling seemed minor, it set a precedent that might impact future incidents. A Disney spokesperson expressed disappointment, but for Martinez, the scars ran much deeper. As disconcerting as this experience was, it pales in comparison to the tragedy faced by a young hostess named Deborah Stone. Deborah Gale Stone, an 18-year-old hostess from Santa Ana, was part of the magic at Disneyland, working the America Sings attraction. Standing at five foot two, with a welcoming smile, her job was to greet the audience as they settled into the rotating theater. But on the tragic night of July 8, 1974, her role took a horrifying turn. Just a little over a week after America Sings reopened at Disneyland, Deborah was performing her usual duties. As the outer ring began to rotate, Moving the audience to the first scene, she approached too closely to the gap between the rotating theater wall and the non-moving stage wall, a seemingly insignificant area that would become a fatal trap. Around 11 p.m. that evening, as the theater was moving into position for a new cycle, Deborah was caught and crushed between the walls. A horrified visitor from the Air Force, thinking he saw a child being pulled in, heard a scream and quickly notified the operators. Deborah's death was swift and shocking, the first employee fatality in Disneyland's 19-year history. America Sings closed for two days following Deborah's tragic death. Safety enhancements were swiftly implemented, including a warning light to alert operators if someone was too close to the danger area.
This sudden and devastating incident served as a grim reminder that even in a place as magical as Disneyland, real-world dangers lurk, requiring constant vigilance and precaution. While physical barriers can be improved, some dangers come from outside the park, as in the shocking case of Nayeli Diana Placentia. Nayeli Diana Placentia, an eight-year-old girl full of dreams and excitement, visited Disneyland with her family on February 12, 1990. She was joyfully riding the Disneyland Railroad, unaware that her adventure would soon turn into a terrifying ordeal. In the neighborhoods surrounding Disneyland, some locals had a dangerous habit of firing their guns into the air. These stray bullets could travel far distances, posing unseen threats. On that fateful day, one such stray bullet found its way into the Fantasyland section of the park. While Nayeli was enjoying her ride, she suddenly felt a sharp pain in her back. Unbeknownst to her, a medium-caliber bullet had struck her lower back. Though she didn't realize she had been shot, she complained to her parents about the sudden pain, leading them to seek medical attention. Surgeons were able to successfully remove the bullet, and Nayeli made a full recovery. The incident was determined to be an unfortunate freak accident, with no reports of intentional shootings. Disneyland graciously offered to help pay Nayeli's medical bills, acknowledging the tragedy's unforeseeable nature. Operations at the park remained unaffected, but the incident served as a stark reminder of how real-world dangers could penetrate even the most magical of places. Though bullets may stray, other dangers lie within the park's own structures, as young Priscilla Figueroa tragically discovered. Six-year-old Priscilla Figueroa of North Hollywood was living every child's dream as she played on Tom Sawyer Island at Disneyland. Brimming with imagination and excitement, she engaged in make-believe, armed with a toy rifle. But her playful adventure would soon become a nightmare, forever altering her childhood innocence. On a sunny day, Priscilla's grandmother accompanied her to the island playground. Climbing the turret leading to the toy rifle, she was immersed in play. In a moment of miscalculation, she used her left hand to brace her body as she dismounted. While dismounting, Priscilla's finger got caught, and two-thirds of her left index finger was pulled off. Paramedics reported that she slipped, and her finger became caught in the trigger. The accident was swift and horrific, leaving both physical and emotional scars. Priscilla was rushed to UCI Medical Center, but doctors were unable to reattach her finger. Disneyland closed the playground for investigation, but did not officially report the incident due to legal loopholes regarding non-mechanical attractions. The incident sparked debates about the ambiguity of state law concerning amusement park safety. Priscilla's father hopes for stringent safety analysis, expressing, I hate to see any other kid have to go through this. Small mishaps can turn into significant injuries, but some accidents, such as on Space Mountain, reveal hidden layers of negligence. Space Mountain has thrilled riders with its dark twists and turns for over two decades. But on the night of July 7, 2000, the excitement turned into terror for nine passengers, including a German woman who suffered multiple bruises. The unexpected malfunction revealed not just a mechanical failure, but underlying issues in the amusement park industry. As passengers were immersed in the darkness of the Tomorrowland ride, a wheel became dislodged from the track at 10.55 p.m. Unknown to the riders, a support arm underneath the car came loose, causing an unexpected stop and leaving the injured passengers stranded. The sudden halt resulted in minor injuries to nine people. Firefighters had to unbolt the seat to remove the most seriously injured passenger. Disneyland spokesperson Ray Gomez stated, All normal ride safety control systems worked as designed and brought the system to a halt. However, this was little comfort to those affected. Disneyland reported the accident to the California Division of Occupational Safety and Health, Cal OSHA, and both parties began investigating. This incident drew attention to the theme park's industry's resistance to oversight and fueled the push for legislation requiring annual inspections, safety guidelines, and accident reporting. The process, however, remained bogged down amid industry objections. While concealment of facts can be deeply troubling, some accidents, like Disneyland's first fatality, are sadly unavoidable. In 1995, a book titled Inside the Mouse, Work and Play at Disney World wrote that, if guests have the nerve to die, they wait, like unwanted calories, until they've crossed the line and can do so safely off the property, suggesting the common misconception that no one dies at Disney. 
but that's not true. The first death to occur in a Disney park happened in Disneyland in 1964, 11 years after the park first opened. It was grad night for Stanford Junior High School, and to celebrate, the school had rented out part of the park after it closed. 15-year-old Mark Maples was as excited as any young teenager would be on such an important night. His excitement was palpable as he spent the evening with his girlfriend and friends, spinning on the teacups and eagerly awaiting a ride on the Matterhorn bobsled, the park's sole thrill ride. It was past midnight when Mark and his friends boarded the Matterhorn. The Matterhorn bobsled, a 147-foot alpine coaster, was a central attraction. It was not your typical roller coaster, but rather a thrilling adventure that slowly ascends to the top of a mountain before letting riders cascade down like a toboggan. This particular ride had just been Mark's first taste of freedom after being grounded for weeks, and the anticipation was sky high. The ride began its slow climb, the darkness enveloping them, and the excitement building. But as they reached the top and began their descent, something went horribly wrong. Mark's friend felt an unexpected bump, and the next moment, Mark's sweater was seen hurtling over the side of the coaster. Panic set in as the boys reached the bottom, desperately trying to alert the attendants. The initial disbelief of the attendants delayed the emergency response, but when EMTs finally reached Mark, they found him lying on a ledge off the side of the track, gravely injured with a fractured skull and broken ribs. Mark was rushed to the hospital, but his injuries were too severe. He died three days later, never regaining consciousness. Disney's official statement indicated that Mark unbuckled his safety restraint and stood up on the bobsled as it was entering the summit. He fell onto the tracks and died of internal injuries. But rumors and speculation swirled among his classmates. Some believed Mark was trying to impress his girlfriend, while others thought it was a prank gone wrong. The incident, ruled accidental, did not lead to any significant changes in safety protocols. How a 15-year-old boy could unbuckle himself during the ride was never questioned, and the case was closed. The death of Mark Maples was the first to occur in a Disney park, but it was not the last. The importance of safety measures was learned early, but some individuals still took fatal risks, such as Thomas Guy Cleveland, whose story serves as a further reminder that even in a place filled with magic, real-world dangers persist. Thomas Guy Cleveland, a 19-year-old from Northridge, had a plan a daring and ill-fated scheme. Rather than paying for a ticket, he decided to sneak into Disneyland. The excitement of entering the park without paying, perhaps the lure of adventure, overcame any sense of caution he might have had. Scaling a six-foot fence was the first obstacle, but it was nothing compared to the 16-foot barrier that awaited him next. After overcoming them both, Cleveland found himself atop a monorail track that led directly into the heart of the park. With the twinkling lights of the park in the distance and the promise of adventures ahead, it might have seemed for a moment that his scheme was a success. But his celebration was cut short. From below, security guards spotted his silhouette against the night sky. One of them, Paul L. Williams, recognized the imminent danger. At that very moment, a monorail, the beacon of Tomorrowland, was cruising towards Cleveland at a brisk 25 miles per hour. Williams cried out a desperate warning. In a panic, Cleveland jumped, landing on a fiberglass canopy just beneath the track. The canopy might have looked like a safe spot, but it didn't offer much clearance. The rapid approach of the monorail left no time for further maneuvers. Those watching below could only stare in horror as the train collided with him, dragging his body a tragic 40 feet. The monorail's operator, Dallas Baker, was oblivious to the young man's presence on the tracks. The only indication that something was amiss was a jolt and an abrupt loss of power. Passengers seated in the front reported feeling a bump, but were otherwise unaware of the grim scene unfolding below. It took nearly 10 minutes before the monorail could be towed to its next station. Anaheim police pieced together the grim details. All four cars had passed over Cleveland. He was found in a tragic state, his adventurous night out ending in a way no one could have imagined. The park was quick to point out that Cleveland had unlawfully scaled two fences, placing himself in harm's way. While some risks are self-imposed, others, like what happened to young Brandon Zucker, are heartbreaking examples of oversight. Wearing Mickey Mouse ears and glowing with excitement, four-year-old Brandon boarded the Roger Rabbit cartoon spin ride at Disneyland on September 22, 2000. The day was special, 
It was his mother Victoria Zucker's 40th birthday, and the family had come to celebrate. As the ride's colorful taxicab cars spun and jostled, Brandon reached down to pick up something he dropped, fell out of the car, was folded in half when another vehicle rolled over him and was pinned underneath for about 10 agonizing minutes. Paramedics had to free him, and he was found to have suffered a torn diaphragm, liver, and spleen. The accident caused him to go into cardiac arrest, resulting in brain damage. The aftermath was devastating. Unable to walk or talk after the accident, Brandon's young life was turned upside down. He was in a drug-induced coma for over a month and lived with his injuries for the remainder of his life. It was discovered that Disneyland employees failed to properly secure Brandon's lap bar which resulted in the accident. This little boy would have been saved if only their staff had done their job well. Disneyland responded by making significant safety changes. Doors were installed on the taxicab cars, a skirt was added to the bottom of the cars, and new protocols were implemented for emergency response. This included instructing employees to dial 911 directly and stationing paramedics inside the park. The Zucker family sued Disneyland, reaching an undisclosed settlement in 2002, estimated by some legal experts to be between $20 million and $30 million. Despite these measures, the incident's scars remained. And then, on a quiet morning in January 2009, Brandon, now 13, was found unresponsive at his Anaheim home. He was pronounced dead the following day at Children's Hospital of Orange County. Negligence can lead to unimaginable pain, as demonstrated in the horrifying incident on Big Thunder Mountain. Nearly 20 years ago, the attraction at Disneyland Resort in California became the scene of a tragedy that would reverberate throughout its history and still haunts the memories of those who knew Marcelo Torres. Marcelo Torres, a 22-year-old graphic designer and aspiring animator, had a promising future ahead of him. That future was tragically cut short on September 5, 2003, when he took his seat in the lead passenger car of the Big Thunder Mountain attraction. On that fateful day, he was accompanied by his best friend and business partner, Vicente Gutierrez, along with two out-of-state friends, ready to enjoy the thrill of the ride. The day was meant to be filled with joy and adventure. However, fate had something else in store. During the thrilling ride, two bolts from the locomotive's left guide wheel assembly came loose and fell off the vehicle, causing an axle to jam into the railroad's ties. The locomotive nosedived, and its rear hit the top of a tunnel. The force snapped a tow bar connecting the locomotive to the lead passenger car, which slammed into the locomotive's undercarriage. Marcelo Torres was killed in the impact, and ten other passengers were injured. The immediate aftermath was chaos and confusion, with Marcelo killed in the accident and ten other passengers injured. The details that emerged later were even more unsettling. Park staff had heard clanking noises at least 30 minutes before the accident, but no maintenance had been done on the broken ride. Furthermore, these operators who heard the clanking at least 30 minutes before the accident kept the coaster running for 12 more rides before deciding to remove it from the track after one more run. The train crashed on the 13th ride. State inspectors would fault a mechanic who hadn't tightened the bolts or attached a safety wire, a manager who declared the ride safe without inspecting it, and Disneyland's maintenance guidelines that allowed workers to sign for procedures done by others. The tragedy led to questions about whether budget cuts at the park had contributed to a larger safety problem. The aftermath of the incident was filled with legal struggles and public scrutiny. In December 2005, Marcelo Torres's parents, Jamie and Carmen Torres, reached a confidential settlement with Disney. The company was forced to admit responsibility for the accident, expressing deep regret and sadness. Marcelo Torres's parents even donated $500,000 of the settlement to provide scholarships for aspiring animators. The Big Thunder Mountain crash was a painful lesson in the importance of diligence, attention to detail, and the value of human life. Technical failures sometimes claim lives, but human errors can be equally fatal, as seen in the Rivers of America tragedy. On a warm June night in 1973, 18-year-old Bogdan Delaro and his 10-year-old brother Dorian embarked on an ill-fated adventure at Disneyland. Visiting from Brooklyn, New York, the siblings were drawn to the Tom Sawyer Island attraction, a decision that would lead to an unforeseen disaster. As the island was about to close, the brothers hid in the woods to extend their visit. 
While staff escorted visitors onto the boats to return to the park, Bogdan and Dorian jumped a fence and hid in the woods behind the burning settler's cabin. When they decided to leave around 9.30 p.m., they chose to swim across the rivers of America to avoid getting caught, even though Dorian couldn't swim. Carrying Dorian on his back, Bogdan began to swim. Tragically, halfway across, he slipped and drowned. Dorian, doggy paddling, was eventually spotted and rescued. Disneyland security officers and Anaheim police and firefighters spent the next eight hours searching for Bogdan. His body was found the next morning between some fake rocks near the island. The Delaro family attempted to sue Disneyland, claiming the attraction had enticed mischief. Though details are scarce, Disney was reportedly cleared of wrongdoing. Bogdan Delarote's memory is preserved in Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Glendale, California. Misadventures can end in tragedy, but the horrors of machinery malfunction are exemplified in the dreadful Christmas Eve incident. Christmas Eve is a time of joy and anticipation, but for the Dawson family, the holiday would forever be marred by a harrowing incident at Disneyland in 1998. Luan Phi Dawson, born in Vietnam on August 28, 1964, was a talented individual destined for success. Rising through the ranks at Microsoft Corporation, he became their senior computer programmer and test engineer at only 33. Luan settled in Duval, Washington with his wife Lou and their son. For Christmas 1998, the family decided to visit Disneyland, California, unaware that their lives were about to change forever. The Dawson family eagerly awaited their turn to board the sailing ship Columbia. Opened on June 14, 1958, the sailing ship Columbia Ride became an instant fan favorite. This replica of the first American ship to circumnavigate the globe set sail on captivating voyages along the rivers of America. The Columbia, departing every 25 minutes, offered a nostalgic charm, immersing guests in 18th century sailing adventures. Until Christmas Eve of 1998, it had an impeccable safety record. As the Columbia approached the dock, something was amiss. The ship was sailing too fast. Assistant General Manager Christine Carpenter, substituting for a regular ride operator, made a fateful decision to attach the mooring line to a metal cleat on the dock. This was against the normal procedure when the ship comes in too fast. The resulting tension caused the eight-pound cleat to rip loose, flinging into the waiting crowd. Luan was struck in the face and neck, tearing part of his jaw off, while the cleat also hit his wife, paralyzing her face. Both were rushed to the hospital, where Luan was pronounced brain-dead. Sadly, he was taken off life support and died on December 28, 1998. Investigations focused on whether the cleat was misused, and if Christine had received proper training. Disney's decision to clean the accident site before police arrival raised eyebrows, but was ultimately accepted as a move to minimize shock for other guests. A damning finding in the lawsuit was that Disney had used inappropriate nylon rope instead of the original hemp for docking, a cost-saving measure that contributed to the accident. There was also a failure to train employees on proper docking procedures and inadequate communication among staff members. The incident sparked nationwide discussions about theme park safety and led to significant legal changes, such as independent inspections of theme parks and mandatory inspections. Disneyland faced a maximum penalty fine for equipment misuse and inadequate training, and the Dawson family reached a settlement estimated at $25 million. The park made several operational changes, including revised docking procedures and updated ride protocols. The tragedy of Luan Phi Dawson serves as a stark reminder that even places designed for joy and wonderment are not immune to the perils of negligence. However, as the park evolved, so did its attractions. But the introduction of new features sometimes led to unexpected dangers. In some cases, even the natural surroundings of the park posed risks. This was starkly evident in a series of incidents involving falling trees which demonstrated that even the most seemingly benign aspects of the park could harbor hidden perils. On a bustling Friday in Frontierland, park visitors, including a group of cheerleaders from Clinton High School and families like the Hogs and Wendells vacationing from out of state, were enjoying their day near the rivers of America and the Golden Horseshoe Review. And then, at around 5.15 p.m., a massive tree, thought to have been in the park since it opened, began to falter. The strong winds that had prevailed the previous day had likely weakened the tree's structure, and despite the efforts of the park's landscape staff to clean up after the storm, 
There was no visible indication of an issue with the tree, but without warning, the tree toppled over, its fall partly broken by a food wagon. The sudden crash startled the nearby visitors. Eighteen park visitors, including five children, were injured in the incident, with abrasions and contusions. Two park employees with minor injuries were treated at the scene. Valerie Pineda, one of the cheerleaders present, recalled the terrifying moment, saying, It just crashed. Audrey Heredia, her fellow cheerleader, added, At first we thought it was a ride because we heard people screaming. The fall was probably linked to the very high winds the day before, according to park spokesman Ray Gomez. The tree's age, over 40 years, may have made it more susceptible to such damage. Frontierland was closed for the evening, leading to disappointment among many guests. Disneyland's response to the emergency was rapid, and the area was roped off for safety. All older trees in the park were set for inspection, and park officials continued to enhance emergency services, including stationing city paramedics full-time at the park. Thankfully, no one was seriously hurt in the incident, but it added to a growing list of safety concerns at the theme park. The accidents involving trees at Disneyland were a poignant reminder that it wasn't just machinery or human error that posed threats, but even the very landscape that provided the park's immersive experience was a danger. However, with every improvement in safety measures, new risks emerge, as seen in the seemingly harmless people mover. This slow, innocuous ride would come to earn a chilling nickname, the People Killer. August of 1967 was a time of excitement and innovation at Disneyland, as Tomorrowland had just introduced its latest marvel, the People Mover. With a leisurely maximum speed of just two miles per hour, this ride, designed to transport guests through every section of Tomorrowland, was a symbol of a bright future. Little did anyone know that its seemingly harmless appearance would soon be overshadowed by tragedy. Ricky Lee Yama, a spirited 17-year-old, was among the excited crowd, eager to experience the novelty of the People Mover. Only one month after its grand opening, Ricky thought it would be amusing to perform a seemingly innocent prank, one that would lead to a horrifying and unforgettable event. The People Mover's design allowed guests to step on and off while the ride was still in motion. In a dark tunnel, Ricky decided to hop out of his car and move to the next one to sit with his friends. It was a spur-of-the-moment decision, a chance to impress and amuse his companions. As Ricky stepped onto the rotating platform, he lost his balance. A sickening, heart-stopping moment followed as he tumbled onto the tracks. Another set of cars came along and Ricky's body was caught under the wheels. The scene that unfolded was gruesome and terrifying. Ricky was dragged for what seemed like an eternity until employees could halt the ride. His body was crushed and mutilated, a nightmarish vision that those present would never forget. The ride had to be disassembled to remove his remains. Tragically, this was not the last incident of its kind. On June 7, 1980, Gerardo Gonzalez would replicate Ricky's fatal stunt, meeting a similarly horrific end. The accidents involving the People Mover sparked outrage and led to rigorous scrutiny of ride safety. The stories of Ricky and Gerardo are harrowing reminders of the delicate balance between thrill and danger, even in seemingly safe attractions. Disneyland was faced with questions about oversight, responsibility, and the very nature of amusement park entertainment. However, despite the grim history of accidents and the lessons learned, Disneyland's allure remains undiminished. At times it seems like people forget all the tragic deaths that stain its floors. Its continued efforts to enhance safety, innovate attractions, and provide joy to millions is a testament to its enduring magic. Yet the echoes of past tragedies linger, whispering cautionary tales that underscore the importance of vigilance and respect for the very mechanisms designed to delight and entertain. Unfortunately, or rather fortunately, we have come to the end of this marathon. If you enjoy long, gruesome marathons like this, check out the other marathons on our channel and don't forget to like and subscribe.